Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites podcast. Today's episode is about the disease of obesity and pre obesity. It's also about weight stigma or weight bias, particularly in healthcare. It's also about health disparities and treatment options for overweight and obesity. My guest today is Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. Dr. Stanford is an obesity medicine physician scientist at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She specializes in the care of adults, adolescents, and children who have overweight or obesity. Welcome to the show, Dr. Stanford. Thanks for having me. Now, do you prefer I call you Dr. Stanford or Fatima or? You can call me Dr. Fatima. Okay, awesome. I understand you're very active on social media and your handle is Ask Dr. Fatima. So we will stay on brand with that. Cool. Well, before we get into today's topic, first of all, I want to say you have more credentials than I have ever seen a human being (laughs) have. You are so accomplished. I don't know when you sleep. You seem like you have hundreds of years of experience. I would love to hear more about you and your background and your work. I'm really interested in why you became interested in medicine as a career to begin with, and then specifically how you navigated towards the weight and obesity care. Absolutely. Well, that's a lot. (laughs) Let's see what I can get in here. First of all, I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, and I think that sets up the framework for, you know, why I became interested in medicine or where my early interests came from to begin with early in my life. And when I say early, like the age of three was when I really decided that I wanted to become a physician. I was surrounded by physicians, not necessarily in my family, but in the Atlanta area. And the zip code that I grew up in, there are more black doctors per capita than anywhere in the United States. Hmm. So, you know, if you can see it, you can be it, right? And I saw, you know, many role models that definitely propelled me into believing that even at the age of three, that being a physician was definitely within my reach and within my future. So that's where that impetus um, to become a physician, my desire to want to care for people, always being that person that wanted to take control of the situation as much as I could, as much as within my control and help people be their best self. So that's that framework. Mm-hmm. In terms of navigating into like this obesity work, really, I would have to say that that was based upon my early experience when I was completing my first master's in public health a little over 20 years ago. A lot of the work that I was doing at that time was particularly focused on obesity within the black community in the Atlanta area. There was a mentor of mine at the time. His name is Dr. Kenneth Resnickow, who's now at the University of Michigan. I was at Emory School of Public Health. That really had a lot of projects focused in the black community. One was called Healthy Body, Healthy Spirit. It was a project looking at um, overweight and obesity within the black church community. There was another project looking at overweight and obesity within African-American adolescent girls. And the name of that project was called Go Girls. So kind of some fun titles. And then there was another um, project looking at overweight and obesity within the WIC population with a heavy focus on the non-Hispanic black population. So that early introduction really kind of heightened my awareness surrounding this issue. And one of the things that I began to notice even back then in the late 90s, which was when I started these degrees, was really the disproportionate impact of obesity on communities of color, but really the non-Hispanic Black community, the community that I come from, was what really brought me to this work, wanting to understand more about the why and how I could help change the overall plight for my population. Thank you for sharing that. It's very interesting. I love that you had such amazing role models and all of these reasons at such an early age to drive your career. You are doing phenomenal work. And I want to put a finer point on the credentials because I kind of glossed over that. In addition to your MD, you have a master's in public health, a master's in public administration, a master's in business administration, and several other fellowship credentials. And you have been the recipient of numerous awards. So of course, I will have all of your your bio and credentials in my show notes for everybody to check that out. And of course, follow you on social media. But before we get into 
the topic today, I, in full disclosure, I do want to share with our listeners that this episode is not sponsored. However, both Dr. Fatima and I are compensated members of an advisory board for a company called Jealousis. Jealousis is a consumer-focused biotherapeutics company and the maker of Plenity, which is a prescription weight management aid. However, this episode is not about Plenity. It's not about this weight management aid, which by the way, is not a medication. We might touch on that later when we talk about tools for treatment and the importance of early treatment. We may not touch on it. It depends on where our conversation goes, but that is how Dr. Fatima and I got connected originally. So I wanted to put that out on the table, of course. Also, one other little factoid, I would love to hear about your background in dance because we have a shared love of ballet. Oh, absolutely. This is one of my favorite topics. I was introduced to dance. Three was a really pivotal year in, in my life. It <laughs> was at the age of three that my parents um, enrolled me in dance class and I was taking ballet, jazz at the time, eventually progressed into taking West African dance and point and hip hop. And I danced all through middle school and then revisited that love um, in college and minored in dance um, at Emory University. And at that time, I choreographed for Emory's Dance Company. I used to teach for the Georgia Ballet. I directed the dance program at one of the YMCA's in the Atlanta area, all before starting medical school, which changed, of course, that entire trajectory. Dance is a huge part of my life. One of my, I guess, most memorable dance experiences was doing a solo piece for Archbishop Desmond Tutu Mm -hmm. when he came Um, to visit the Emory campus. They needed someone to dance and they needed it quickly. And I was like, I don't, I can't get my entire body of dancers, but I can do something (laughs) myself. And they were like, okay, I guess we'll go with that. I almost kicked him, you guys. Um, Thankfully I did not because I I didn't realize I was as close to him (laughs) as I was, but I did not. I did receive a standing ovation. So it was a very proud moment (sighs) in my dance world. And it's something that I'm always still very connected to dance the way movement is really a universal language, and it allows us to be connected to our bodies, listen to our bodies. And and regardless of your size, your race, mm. your ethnicity, your gender, it's something that can make you feel good. So it's a huge part of still who I am, although not obviously at the level that I was back in the late 90s, early 2000s, but definitely still a huge part of just who I am as a human being. Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And my listeners know that I uh, took a 25-year hiatus from ballet after my stint at the Performing Arts High School, and I am loving it. And uh, I just recently had a ballerina turned dietitian guest on the show to talk about nutrition for dancers. So people can check that out if they're also interested. So let's jump into the conversation. Maybe a good place to start is what's your perspective and what you're seeing in your world, this current state of affairs with obesity? What do we need to know to kind of set the stage for this conversation? Absolutely. So when we look at obesity, I want to set the framework by using some of the epidemiology, right, to talk about what we're seeing, at least in the United States and the prevalence of obesity. So based upon 2018 data, and yes, I know that we're not in 2018, but this is the most recent like actual hard data, Mm -hmm. we know that 42.4% of U.S. adults have the disease of obesity. So I just want you guys to think about that, let that resonate, let that marinate through your brain, the prevalence of obesity being almost half the U.S. adult population. So by far, the largest chronic disease of our time, hands down. With regards to children, which I also take care of, we're seeing about 20% of of the pediatric population with the disease of obesity based upon the same year, that 2018 year being when we collected NHANES. And NHANES um, stands for National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data, which is actual measured data as opposed to self-report data. So this is a big problem, no pun intended at all. It's a problem that has been neglected for a long time, and it's a disease that's been neglected. And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that it was only in 2013 that the American Medical Association acknowledged obesity as a disease. Mm. For those that are listening, the AMA uh, or the American Medical Association is the largest body of physicians in the U.S. representing all specialty states. Um, districts, et cetera. So about 270,000 physicians represented by that body. 
And it took them until 2013 to acknowledge that obesity was a disease. So you can imagine that if physicians are just coming to terms with this, then how do we anticipate that everyone else would recognize obesity for the disease that it is? And so that's a bit of the framework of obesity as a disease. Now, I do want to touch on what brought me to this work, which I mentioned a bit earlier, which was the disproportionate impact of obesity in communities of color. Mm -hmm. And what we do know is that if we look at racial and ethnic minority groups, non-Hispanic black population, Hispanic or Latin, Latin A, Latin X, depending upon which terminology you guys use, and the native population, which unfortunately never makes it to the maps that the CDC puts out, Mm -hmm. have much higher rates of obesity than the non-Hispanic white population in the U.S. And so why does this disparity exist brought me to this work and and how can I go about being part of the solution also was a major impetus for me getting involved, engaged and making this my life's work. And you have a TED talk that we'll link to in the show notes as well that talks about the three pandemics, obesity, COVID-19 and racism. And it's really compelling. So I'll be sure to include that. Absolutely. So In the vein of recognizing obesity as a disease, let's talk a little bit deeper about why that's important. And I remember when this happened, like you said, in 2013, and I remember that shift in thinking. And of course, as a dietitian who's been caring for people with overweight and obesity my whole career, I thought, well, you know, not that this is just semantics, but, oh, well, I was always viewing it as a disease, but there's more to it. So let's talk about why it's important to label that correctly. And also, you know, we'll be talking about this throughout the whole episode, but, you know, words matter, language matters, and people might be listening and hearing for the first time, people with overweight or obesity or who have overweight or obesity, not overweight or obese people. There's all these shifts. So can you talk more about why it's important to recognize it as a disease? Absolutely. So when we look at obesity as just a condition or um, something of that sort, it makes it seem like the onus is on the individual to control it, that it's all within their control. They can just eat less and exercise more and we can just solve obesity. Hmm. Well, when we know that it's a disease and what we do know about obesity is that it's a disease that is regulated by the brain, particularly the hypothalamus, the part of the brain that regulates our weight. And when we recognize that, we recognize that that has nothing to do with our willpower. It has something to do with our internal signaling between our brain and our gut that tells us whether or not we're going to be leaner or whether or not we're going to have more excess weight. And so once we recognize the pathophysiology of this complex disease that we're learning more and more about each day, then we can begin to actually treat that 42.4% of U.S. adults, which is probably closer to 50% in the post-pandemic era Mm. that actually have the disease instead of just telling them, you know, go eat less and exercise more and just solve your own problem because it's not just a problem. It's a disease. It's a disease that actually has pathophysiology. It's a disease that has targets in the brain that we can have an impact on Mm -hmm. just like we do with diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease or sleep apnea or cancers of any kind there is pathophysiology. We don't tell patients when they come in with cancer, you know what, you could have not gotten this cancer if you just, you know, exercise a little bit more. We know exercise helps decrease the risk of cancer and go go home and why don't you take care of it? Or someone comes in with diabetes, you know, that blood sugar is really high. You know, I think that if you just go eat a little bit less, take out sugar out of your diet, everything will be soft. <laughs> that's not the approach that we take with other diseases, but that's exactly the approach that we take with obesity. And I think it's absolutely absurd. Mm -hmm. And it's really hurtful um, to my patient population and to those that don't even recognize this as a disease and still put the blame on themselves because that's what they've been taught to believe their entire lives. If we don't recognize it as a disease, then we're not really exploring and engaging in treatment options. And this lends us into the conversation about weight stigma and weight bias. So if only 65% of patients with obesity recognize that it's a serious condition and disease, and only 38% of people with obesity report talking about weight loss with their healthcare provider, there's these barriers set up to even getting to the table to talk about this. And also, 
I'd love for you to speak to why doctors are reluctant to initiate these conversations because I know there's some some information there on that. Yeah. So let me start with your last question first, and then hopefully get to the other questions. So. Oh, sure. Sorry. I tend to do that. I tend to throw out a few yeah, ideas. Yeah. No, yeah. So let me, let me go there. So let's talk about doctors, the, the body to which I belong, and let's talk about our lack of education about obesity. So, you know, I published a paper in the International Journal of Obesity that came out in early 2020, where we looked at the education that physicians, um, resident physicians, fellow physicians received throughout the entire world. We didn't focus on the U.S. because I wanted to see what was the framework of what's going on in the, you know, not only the U.S., but the entire world. And we found in the systematic review of the entire world that no physicians are really taught about obesity in any systemic way on a consistent basis. All right. So that means that we have no country that we can look to and say, oh, you know, Denmark is doing a great job here of educating their docs about obesity. Mm -hmm. If this is a worldwide pandemic, not just something that affects us in the U.S., which a lot of people seem to think is true. They think it's just a U.S.-based issue. There is a whole world obesity federation for a reason. Mm. This is a worldwide issue. But if no doctors are learning anything about this, you can imagine that if someone comes into their office that has obesity, they're not equipped to handle it because they haven't been taught. We began to learn about other chronic diseases starting day one of medical school. I mean, diabetes, I can, I'm can. i guaranteeing you that I learned something on day one. I don't remember what day one of med school was. It was a while ago. <laughs> but I can guarantee you that something was taught about that disease. Something was taught about heart disease. Something was taught about cancer. Something, but nothing has been taught about obesity. And while there's a very small shift in this thought process, I would say that there's still gross under education of physicians about how to treat obesity, about the fact that it's even a disease is part of why I give on average 150 lectures a year because of the demand, because people haven't learned the basics that I typically give in a typical lecture. So that's, I think, the key point there. And if patients don't feel invited or welcomed in the setting to talk about this disease because they've never been nurtured in that way, then you can imagine, why would they bring this up with their doctor? They, if they bring it up, then maybe they feel like they'll be scolded for something they did wrong to cause their weight problem. And I'm putting that in air quotes. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, oh, you know what? I see that you you know have some excess weight. You know, I, I can help you with that. Let's talk about some strategies that we can utilize to assist you. That's a different conversation. That's not the conversation that's being had and most healthcare facilities with most physicians or even physician extenders, i.e. our nurse practitioners, PAs, et cetera. Registered dietitians, yes. <laughs> yeah, RDs. Oh, I can't forget you guys. I love you guys. <laughs> I didn't forget you guys. But, you know, in the typical, like, you know, patient interaction before we even get to you guys, because RD, I think, is the next step that even we don't have enough of you that are really taught about obesity as a disease as opposed to it just being oh, we need to modify just their diet, make them eat a little less and, you know, create a calorie deficit and then solve the problem. Yeah. So obviously we can understand a patient who's overweight, or I'm sorry, I should, I, here I go. A patient with overweight or obesity isn't going to be really excited about bringing this up with their doctor. We, we get that. That makes sense. It's not good. But now we're looking at, oh, doctors aren't bringing it up with patients. And there is this bias or stigma, some of it is explicit, some of it's implicit. So I think that by recognizing obesity as a disease will help shed the light on some of this stigma and bias. But I'd like you to talk a little bit more about, you know, if they're not educated on obesity, then certainly they're not educated on how to talk with patients about obesity. And then are there other barriers that go into this uh, equation as far as why they're not talking with patients very much about it. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about if you're not educated about obesity, how can you even talk with your patients about it? So if you're not educated, I can tell you you're going to shy away from the conversation. Or alternatively, let's say you've always been lean, never had any weight struggles, and just presume that, oh, those people that have obesity, they could just be like me and do what I do, whatever that is. And so there are these things that we project because one thing I can tell you about, particularly about being an obesity medicine physician, is that 
everyone feels like they're an expert in obesity mm. um, because maybe they've lost weight at some point in their life. And so because they did this and it worked for them, it should really extrapolate to the entire population because we're all the same person, which we know is not the case, right? I'm being a bit facetious. Mm -hmm. And that's where some of this idea of like patients feeling really uncomfortable or even doctors feeling uncomfortable, maybe maybe they're a physician that gained weight and they presume it was their fault too. So how do they even begin to broach this with their patients? Mm -hmm. Let's get into that language piece though. This is a huge, 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 huge part of it. The language that we use matters. We have to recognize that patients have the disease of obesity, but they're not defined by it. So that language that we talked about, the words that I have us eliminate from our language are the word obese. Obese is inflammatory. It's stigmatizing. A patient has obesity, but they're not defined by it, which means an obese person. And then also the word morbid, which really, 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 really irks me. Morbid obesity is a term that's used, which is also stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. Like I always will mention, we don't call it morbid COVID, yet we've hit a milestone with over 750,000 lives lost in the United States. But are we calling it morbid COVID? Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that. Have you guys heard that? So why are we doing that? I think it's because of our stigma, our bias, both implicit and explicit, that helps us frame obesity in a way that is just really derogatory. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's part of the problem there. So that language that we use matters and making our healthcare settings inviting to individuals that have obesity. I will always make statements about how our nonverbal cues in healthcare can set up a situation where a person feels welcome or not welcome. So let's say you arrive at the doctor's or the dietitian's office, my dear Melissa, mm -hmm. um, there is a seat, there are chairs in the room, mm -hmm. chairs that all have armrests that are pretty confining. I'm a person that, you know, that has severe obesity and I can't fit in that chair. I look at it, I eye it out. I'm like, oh, there's no way I can fit there. Mm -hmm. So I stand up in the waiting and then people are like, oh, why don't you sit down? And I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm fine. I'm saying I'm fine because I have nowhere to sit. You haven't recognized that there's no place for me to sit in this waiting room. I would like to sit down. Maybe I'm tired. I, you know, want to get, you know, rest. But you've sent a nonverbal cue to me hmm. as a patient that I don't belong here hmm. because I don't even have a seat to sit in. Wow. Right? Those nonverbal cues tell the patient at the outset that you do not matter. And we have to be thoughtful of these things. I mean, I just use the, you know, the chairs in the waiting room, but wait, what if you don't have the right blood pressure cuff? Maybe you don't have a gown that fits them if we're doing um, an exam with gowns. These are types of things that, you know, seem very simple and actually are relatively inexpensive to change, but why don't we do it? Right. Because we don't really think about the vantage point. It's about not having that empathy towards persons that have excess weight. Yeah, we need to adjust our lens and see things through other people's viewpoint. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned the really excellent point about, you know, the physician may have been lean their whole life, or maybe they've gained weight. And of course, we see this with dietitians too. I could, I should probably do a whole segment on that. <laughs> yes. Slender dietitians <laughs> I, versus yeah. those with overweight and ob obesity, eating disorders aside. But you're right. I see this so much with the conversation, maybe especially on social media, where people are like, well, this is what I did. And this is what everybody needs to do. And I've even had conversations on LinkedIn with people about this, where I've posted about, you know, you know, it's not just about willpower, we need to support people with overweight and obesity. And I've had people say, well, they just need to do this and do that. I'm like, that's not and I'm sure you've had a lot of conversations too, like just trying to say, well, I'm glad that worked for you. But that doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. And I see this especially with overweight and obesity conversations. But now that I think about it, I know we see this in diabetes as well, I and mean, probably cancer treatment as well. But it's a really good point that we are going to kind of lead into a little bit later is we're all different. You mentioned that earlier, and we all know right. it. We're all different. We have unique needs. And that's why we need a variety of treatment options. But I don't want to jump ahead to that just yet. What else do we want to discuss regarding weight, stigma, and bias in healthcare and our own personal stigma and bias. But also, I'd like to hear more about how the health disparities and maybe even access to treatment, access to healthcare weighs into this conversation, no pun intended. 
Yeah, you know, when we look at overweight and obesity globally, regardless, not globally, let's focus on the U.S., one of the issues that we have run into is that coverage for obesity care across the continuum of looking at work with a dietitian, work with a physician, use of medications, et cetera, is really poorly covered in most places throughout the country. A lot of this reflects Medicare and their exclusion in their Part D of any, for example, anti-obesity medications completely excluded for older adults, which is predominantly what Medicare is made up of. Mm-hmm. A lot of this comes from this knowledge of or this thought process of obesity not really being a disease, right? We can deny because it's not really something that needs medication. Although, interestingly enough, the Federal Drug Administration has approved many medications for obesity starting in 1959, folks, so just a few years ago, that they began to approve medications. If we look at access, Medicare sets the stage for what happens. And we have been trying, for example, to get um, a bill through Congress called TROA, which is the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act since 2013, in both the House and Senate, which would cover two key primary tenets in the Medicare population. Number one, it would cover behavioral therapy for the treatment of obesity, which would be work with dietitians. Melissa, you know, right now, you do not get a chance to work with a dietitian in the United States unless you have diabetes already. Right. So sorry, you have obesity, don't have diabetes, you have prediabetes, have high insulin um, resistance, but you know, wait until you get diabetes. And now we can send you over to see Melissa and get that visit covered. Right. What a travesty that is. I mean, come on, we wait until you get diabetes to teach you how to eat well? Mm -hmm. Really? Hmm. That sounds a bit bizarre. A little backwards, yeah. Similarly, you know, medication coverage is, like I said, they completely excluded in Medicare Part D. And so this bill is to cover both behavioral therapy and pharmacotherapy, i.e. medications for obesity. But like I said, we've been trying to get this across since 2013, right around the time when the AMA recognized obesity as a disease. You know, the government governs what happens in terms of accessing government-based insurance, Medicare, then uh, um, subsequently Medicaid, which of course is for our lower income population, really sets the framework for what happens even in the private insurance world. If Medicare begins to cover, you can bet that Medicaid will cover, you can bet that private insurers will cover the treatment for obesity across the spectrum from behavioral therapy to pharmacotherapy, which is medications, to surgical interventions. Mm. And right now there is no consistency, mostly because if you look from the top, which is where the government starts, there isn't a consistent um, acknowledgement of obesity as a disease and the treatment modalities that can best serve the population. Wow. Wow. Yes. So you, you talked about this therapeutic landscape from behavioral counseling to pharmacotherapy to even surgery. I know bariatric surgery is one of the most successful treatment options out there. And I remember it was kind of rejected initially. And it was sort of the same concept of, well, you need to get to a certain size before you're eligible. And it's not my area of expertise right now. But you know, I know that that's being utilized. Quick question for you. Maybe it's not a quick answer. But why <laughs> if pharmacotherapy is underutilized? Why is that? I have some suspicions, but... Why are medications have you... Well, actually, this is great that we're talking. I just had a paper that came out within the last 48 hours Hmm. in the Mayo Clinic proceedings looking at the landscape of prescription medications for obesity that literally just came out within the last 48 hours. And our paper demonstrates that only 1% of patients that meet criteria for obesity medications or anti-obesity medications get access it was 2% and now it was 1% in our paper. So between 1% to 2%, depending upon whose paper you're looking at, I think you could say that those are relatively congruent, 1% to 2%. And I have thoughts about why this is. Number one, I think it goes back to the education piece, right? If you're not educated about obesity as a disease, then how are you to know how medications work or act or how you use them? There's no knowledge there. Number two, coverage of these medications is sparse. I reside in Massachusetts where under the employer-sponsored plans, we do have better coverage for anti-obesity medications than other states. But if you go and look at what we see for those patients that fall under the Medicaid realm, which is those that may be of lower income, those that are Medicare, mostly older adults, there is no coverage of these medications. So, you know, I always say people always get excited and they hear, oh, well, I've heard there's new medicine coming out. It doesn't matter to me if I can't get it to my patients. 
Right. If it's a great medicine and I see all the wonderful studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Lancet, et cetera, that's wonderful. But it only matters if I can get it to the patient that's in front of me. Mm. And until that can happen, it's like a shiny ornament that's sitting up on a top shelf that I can't get to. Mm. Or, you know, if we're talking about access for different groups, I talked about the employer sponsored insurance persons being able to get access to these medicines under certain plans. So then only that select group gets access. Mm. That select group may not be the group that's most affected by obesity. So there's multiple reasons, right? So let's sum it up. We have our education piece. We have our insurance coverage piece. We have our access piece. All of these play a role. And then I have, I would be remiss if I did not bring up this major issue. There was a medication that was widely used back in the 1990s called Fenfen. And Fenfen was a combination of fenfluramine with fentramine, which is still on the market. So fenfluramine, and for those of you looking this up, it was F-E-N-F-L-U-R-A-M-I-N-E. And this medication combination did cause dramatic weight loss, but the fenfluramine component, which was eventually removed from the market, caused heart valve issues. Obviously, we want people to lose weight, but we want to do it in a safe way. When that happened, doctors were using them, really excited, seeing people lose 50 pounds in six months, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But that terrified physicians. Mm -hmm. So there is now a strong sense of fear from that group that was, I would say, gung-ho for a period of time. Like, oh, we have this medication that works. And then there was this, I guess, neglect of anything that came subsequently. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that really set up a, a negative stigma surrounding the the use of these agents and the safety profile of these agents because of that historic information. Yeah, I was actually an outpatient dietitian around that time and did have several patients on it. And I remember that vividly. Yeah. So we remember the scary things about medications. And I'm just curious in general, I, I talk about this a lot on the podcast, especially as a diabetes educator. I feel like, you know, the average person thinks that medication is bad. Maybe it's especially with diabetes. Well, they're hearing that message too. And it kind of overlaps with the obesity conversation where, well, with diabetes, you know, you can control it with diet and exercise. And if you need to graduate to a medication, that's because you didn't do your job. You didn't do it right. You didn't do it well enough. And so that medication is seen as the failure. You know, people do have concerns about risks, which obviously, you know, you do want to weigh the benefits and risks with your physician in a conversation. But I feel like with diabetes, well, I mean, obviously type one, well, you have to have insulin, right? You can't survive without it. With type two, again, it kind of bleeds over into the obesity arena, even though there are certainly people with type two who are not over, who do not have overweight or obesity. I even have to check myself with that language, but it's still seen there's that stigma with that. So I would love to hear your perspective as a physician do you see that patients feel that medication is bad and they obviously you want to do what you can and not just medicate everything, but there's a reason for medications. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it's really interesting. And I, I want to set up the dimorphism or the contrast for diabetes because many of the medications that we utilize, um, particularly today, a lot of the newer agents were approved for diabetes well before they got approval for obesity. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason we see that also is because of the bias that exists even in the approval bodies, right? Mm -hmm. Why is the medication getting approved for diabetes four, five, six years before it gets approved for obesity when we know it works for obesity? I think it gets back to those biases. So, you know, it's interesting when patients come in, I think patients, by the time they make it to me and, and you know, a tertiary level center where they've tried many, many other things right before they finally get to me are, are more receptive to the idea of medications, but they aren't necessarily receptive to the idea that the medications will be a long-term commitment. Hmm. I always tell my patients that these medications act on how the brain sees weight. They act on different parts of the brain. For example, Ventramine inhibits norepinephrine reuptake in the hypothalamus. I know that sounds like a, like a lot of bit of science, but that's what it does. You know, whereas the GLP-1s, which we call the glucagon-like peptide 1s, they act to stimulate the POMC or the pro-opium melanocord in the brain, which tells us to eat less and store less. All these medications actually work usually on the brain or on, on the periphery, meaning like the midsection, et cetera, to decrease weight 
but they only work as long as you're using them, mm. right? So if someone goes on it, they lose 50 pounds, you take them off the medicine, what happens? They gain 52 pounds. Mm. And you might wonder why I said 52 when I just said 50. It's because the body typically tries to rebound and defend a set point that's higher because it's like frustrated that, you know, you try to deviate from what its initial set point was. <laughs> So I think that our bias towards recognizing that these medications also need to be used long term. But it's interesting when patients have high blood pressure and they go on a high blood pressure med or one or two or three or four, whatever they need. Nobody says, oh, when am I going to come off that medicine? I know. (laughs) Right. (laughs) They're not like, oh, when do I come off my diabetes med? You know, like I know I have diabetes. Let me come off of it. When do I do I get off of it? Maybe next month? Well, people do hope about that. They do hope about that. But not as much. Not as much. With obesity, they're like, okay, so when can I stop it? And I'm like, you know, why ask the, I try to educate before starting, like let them know that if we go down this pathway and if it works, we don't pull that medication back because the medication is helping you change your set point mm-hmm. and it only works as long as as we can. Interesting point. Very interesting. Along those lines, combination therapy has become the norm for diabetes. And that's partly due to the fact that different medications have different mechanisms and work on different organs. Maybe I'm putting the cart way before the horse, but do you see that as something that would make sense that that would also potentially be the case for obesity medications? There's different types of medications for obesity. Could it be that somebody might need two different or three different types of? Oh, absolutely. So many of my patients um, actually do are in combination pharmacotherapy. They may be on three, four, five different agents to treat their obesity. Though I think my patients are used to me saying it is like, you know, we're having to kind of throw the kitchen sink at the problem, right? We start with one, we maximize one medication then we start another medication, get some additional benefit, then maybe start a third medication. And so in reality, what we see in real life, particularly in obesity medicine, is patients on combination agents, not just on one or two, maybe even three, four, maybe even five. Much like we're treating resistant hypertension, hmm. we're re- treating resistant obesity. And some people require more than others. Some people, I can just put them on one agent, and that agent is the agent that works And then then often for people that are listening, there's a lot of trial and error for me to figure out what works for you. Mm -hmm. Unlike, you know, cancer, where, you know, they do a lot of studies to find out what drug should work on what receptor for this type of cancer to know what agents to give you. We don't have that level of precision really in anything else in medicine. And so there is a lot of trial and error. And, you know, I always tell the patient that I can you know, based upon certain information and the thousands of patients I've cared for start at a certain place, but maybe that's not where we end up. And so it requires a lot of, you know, back and forth, a lot of listening to their internal cues to drive my management for them, because I can't determine which receptor is defective in their brain that I need to fix. So yeah. No, that makes sense. So it might seem obvious But I'd love you to articulate why early treatment is so important. And we've talked about how and why that hasn't been happening. But I'd love for you to articulate why early treatment is so important. Absolutely. So as someone who cares for both pediatric and adult population, I think I'm going to kind of yield to my peds patients to kind of explain why that early treatment matters. I published several papers, one particularly that compared young people, meaning children and adolescents that had gotten bariatric surgery compared to our adult patients. And while both groups do well, the kids, i.e. the adolescents, they don't like to think of themselves as kids, Mm -hmm. do significantly better. And then you might wonder why, right? So if we tackle obesity before it develops into a host of major chronic diseases, Hmm. you can imagine that we can modify that person's life as it relates to the development of those diseases and or for those people that may have already developed diabetes at 14, you know, type 2 diabetes, for example, Mm -hmm. if they've only had it for a year, the likelihood that they'll resolve that diabetes um, after surgery is pretty high compared to someone that's had diabetes for, let's say, 30 years, right? The longer that you've had it, the more perturbations on your system, the better the likelihood that we can not only treat that disease, the, the overarching disease, which is the obesity, but all of the diseases that are downstream impacts from the obesity. So early intervention matters is also why 
the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with very strong statements in 2019 supporting the early use of metabolic and bariatric surgery for pediatric patients with severe obesity, recognizing that early intervention is key, not only in terms of their health outcomes, but in terms of just their entire life. Um, When we look at their ability to get into medical school or undergraduate school or to get a job, the biases that people have towards individuals with obesity are so vast that their opportunities are often affected by their their excess weight. So it's a multifold reason as to why we want to treat early. Health is obviously the first and foremost, but there are a lot of other issues that would be things that we need to consider. Great point. Now, I realize I mentioned the term pre-obesity early on in the episode. And so I want to come back to that so that I don't leave people hanging (laughs) because it's kind of a new term to me. Can we talk about what pre-obesity is Absolutely. So pre-obesity is much like when we think about pre-diabetes. Um, I think that's the easiest way for us to think about it. So when we look at diabetes, we use, let's first say, for example, a hemoglobin A1C to determine once you've crossed into this threshold of having diabetes. And that threshold, for example, is 6.5 hemoglobin A1C. So then we have this kind of at risk for diabetes, which is the pre-diabetes group, right? Those are people that have a hemoglobin A1C that goes from 5.7 to 6.4. Okay, so let's think about that. We got that, right? Those people that are pre-diabetes can develop diabetes. And so let's look at this idea of pre-obesity, which is also a term, the term, you know, you would say persons with overweight. So persons with overweight are at risk for developing obesity because they're closer to it, Right. And so these are the people that we want to be hyper vigilant about maybe preventing obesity with because they are closer to that threshold than someone that has a healthier weight. So that's the idea behind pre-obesity. Pre-obesity and those that have overweight are considered to be interchangeable, much like pre-diabetes can develop into diabetes. That's how we look at that. Okay, great. Yes. And I'm wondering, as we're talking about how words matter and language matters, if that is also a way to increase awareness and address the importance of early treatment and not waiting until things get farther down the line. Yeah, you know, I think it's really kind of basic thinking to think about like treating something before it becomes a major problem. I mean, let's think about like in your home, right? If you have a small leak in Mm -hmm. your faucet, a really tiny leak, just a little bit of a leak, you're like, oh, you know, if you fix it then, then it doesn't return into an issue where you have like a major issue that costs, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars, maybe destroyed other parts of your homes. If you had just addressed it when it was a little leak, then it wouldn't have developed into a big issue. This is exactly the same thinking, right? When we're thinking about obesity and unfortunately, particularly for our pediatric patients or kids is it requires an entire family of focus, a entire family of commitment to make the shift. And the thing that I haven't touched on that I have to touch on is this idea of this heritability of obesity. If you're born into a family that has obesity, whether you eat well, exercise, sleep well, do all the best things that you can do, your likelihood of having obesity is still on the order of 50 to 85 percent likelihood just because of kind of the cards you were dealt, the family you were born into. Right. So we have to be mindful of these things because all of these things play a role. And the earlier that we can make an intervention to have an impact on our patients, the better it is for them, their overall health, their quality of life, and the life of even their children or offspring. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. As you're talking, I'm thinking, I'm five, seven and a half. That was determined by my genes. I mean, I know that there's obesity is more complex than genetic height, but it just makes me think back to, you know, where the obesity stigma originated. And I'm wondering, and this may be way off topic and maybe subject for another episode, but if it's tied to racism or low income populations. And I know historically, I I had an interesting interview with Dr. Kari Nixon about medical humanities. And she was talking about how over the years, you know, being overweight, way back in the early days, I don't know the dates, but being overweight was seen as a sign of um, wealth and whatever society values at any particular time. So I don't know if you have any comments to that, but I'm just kind of brainstorming out loud. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think that if you look at it from an international lens, there are still societies, you know, kind of uh, larger body types are more valued. They're a sign of wealth, particularly in low income countries and some middle income countries. The larger your body type means that you have food to eat. Mm -hmm. It means you're not poor. It means that you are more affluent. And most Western societies being thin or thinness is valued. I would say this was derived from, you know, the Twiggy era, right, where models began to be defined as beautiful if they were thin and lean. If you could be thin and lean in the midst of relative wealth, that meant that you had better control of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so all of these, these thought processes really play into how we think and value ourselves. And I think it's important for the individual to recognize that regardless of their weight, that they matter, and they're valued. But our society definitely drives, particularly our society here in the US, towards leanness mm -hmm. and thinness, regardless of how someone got thin or lean. I think we also need to be mindful about not immediately remarking about someone's weight when we see them. Oh my gosh, it looks so great. You've lost weight. Yeah. When we make that comment, we have no idea how that happened. Maybe they had a death in their family. Maybe they lost a family member or friend. Maybe they're going through a divorce. Divorce often leads to some significant weight loss. Maybe they actually have a medical condition that's causing them to lose weight. Maybe they have some type of cancerous process, for example. Mm -hmm. And so when we remark that this patient looks amazing, or person, my brain thinks patient, sorry, mm -hmm. we're assuming that that's a good thing. Right. As opposed to, I, I try to not remark on that. I might remark on your hair or your new glasses or your dress. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily remarking your weight, even as an obesity medicine physician, because I also know, having taken care of, you know, thousands of patients in my career, that the weight loss that even my patients have may not be driven by something that they wanted, you know, to happen. And sometimes it is, obviously, if I'm intentionally creating weight loss, but there are other times where there are other life factors that may have led to them losing weight. And so I just think we have to be mindful of that piece also. Excellent point. What do you say to the proponents of the health at every size movement? I mean, as, a, as a, an obesity medicine physician. Yeah, you know, for all of the Hayes movement, the health at every size, you know, the only place that we overlap in terms of our thinking is that I do believe, regardless of who you are, how, what you weigh, that you are beautiful. I do believe because you're just a human being, right? And that being a human being is be a beautiful thing. As we get beyond that, I think that the denial of obesity as a disease is a deed of travesty. And often I'm on calls or roundtables with individuals that are part of the Hayes movement that say I over pathologize obesity. Hmm. I'm not over pathologizing it. I'm just giving it the pathology that it does deserve. And the denial of that pathology leads to worsened outcomes, worse health. Mm -hmm. We know that the number one reason that patients have died from COVID-19 is because of obesity in both the pediatric and adult population. Do I deny that or do I recognize it, treat my patients for their obesity and get them to the best, healthiest weight for them? I don't give them a target number. Let me tell you, my patients have been trying to get target weights out of me for years, but I don't do that intentionally because I don't believe in needing to get to a certain BMI, but I do believe that obesity is a disease. I'm willing to teach you about the pathophysiology of the obesity as a disease, how adipose, which is fat, not something we call people, is an organ. And when there is dysfunction in the adipose tissue, it leads to inflammation and chronic issues throughout the entire body. That I can't deny. I can't deny the science. And I do believe that when we're looking at the Hayes movement, we're denying the science. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like you're the perfect person to, to address that question. And I mean, yes, everybody has their opinions, but I'm very happy to have the obesity medicine physician <laughs> weigh in on that. So thank you. Yeah. As we're wrapping up, my audience is a mix of healthcare professionals and the general public. So as a physician, what would your takeaways be for anybody listening who is not a healthcare professional or not a dietitian? And likewise, for anybody who is, if you could sort of have two different takeaways, and maybe they're the same from what we've talked about today and how we can help be part of the solution in addressing obesity as a disease. So I think my message is going to be the same to both populations, actually. So I'm going to I'm going to put it all under one umbrella because, you know, talking to doctors that are well-trained and Harvard doctors that have no knowledge about obesity, I think 
very few people have knowledge. And so number one, I would just say obesity is a disease. If you are confused about this, if you want more, we'll have Melissa put in the show notes, um, my lecture to the Radcliffe Institute on obesity, it's more complex than you think, where you can actually learn about the pathophysiology of this disease and really change your framework of thinking of this calories in, calories out mantra that has failed us because it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So number one, it's an old disease. Number two, it disproportionately impacts communities of color. There are multiple reasons why that go from looking at racism to social determinants of health, et cetera, that really caused that dimorphism to some of the genetics and things that we've learned from what we call GWAS or genome-wide association studies. So there's multiple reasons there. Number three, we actually can treat patients for this disease along a continuum, which includes the work with my dietitian colleagues like yourself, to the work with myself and other obesity medicine physicians and internists, pediatricians, et cetera, that are willing to delve into the space, to the work of the bariatric surgeons, and also not neglecting that all-important mental health component, which includes the work with our psychologists and psychiatrist colleagues, recognizing huge implications for obesity and overweight, in patients and things that we need to make sure that we're delving into there. I also don't want to neglect my exercise physiology colleagues that really are, are key in helping us to know how to move, how to navigate space, regardless of our size. Mm -hmm. And so I think that those are the key things that I want to leave. And if you're concerned about like, how do I begin to work and, and explore this space for the dietitians, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, has a lot of focus on training and overweight and obesity. There are special programs that they do for those that are in the physician space, the American Board of Obesity Medicine. You can be certified in that and you can get certification through courses at the Obesity Society, the Obesity Medicine Association, the Harvard Blackburn course, the Cornell Columbia Obesity course, the Cleveland Clinic course, many courses now that are dedicated specifically to obesity. And then for the general public, you know, you can always follow me. You can follow. I try to put up all of the different lectures and media engagements that I'm doing, but also look to those trusted voices in the community. We have a lot of knowledge to share and we want to help. And I just want those that are struggling with the disease of obesity to know, number one, it is not your fault. Number two, there are those of us there that are willing and able to provide you with the care that you need and the care that you deserve. Thank you so much, Dr. Fatima. That is wonderful. I am just so thrilled to have you on the show and to get this opportunity to work with you on our digital advisory board and uh, share our passion of ballet as well. For everybody listening, I will have links to everything in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com, including some information about Plenity. I mentioned it at the beginning of the show. And we didn't touch on it, but I didn't want to leave anybody hanging. So if you're curious about that, I'll have some links to information in my show notes as well. So thank you again, Dr. Fatima, for all the amazing work you're doing. I certainly will continue to follow you, and I hope that other people will too. You're on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram at Ask Dr. Fatima. Thank you. Thank you. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG in Detroit Podcasts.